It's great to be here. I am always very happy to come to Russia. And one of the main reasons why I like it so much is because you people are the world leaders in understanding that aging is a bad thing and we need to fix it. I have spent most of my time in the past 10 or 15 years on stage, on camera, trying to persuade people to be rational about aging, to understand that aging is the world's biggest problem and that it's a problem we should be able to solve using medicine of the foreseeable future. In Russia, I don't have that problem. People seem to get it much more easily. So today, as you can see from my subtitle, I am going to give a rather unusual talk, partly because in 15 minutes it's not really possible to talk through the details of the science that we do at Sense Research Foundation. And anyway, the long talks that I give are all over YouTube. You can look at them yourself. The other reason, though, is because of you. Because people who already understand the value of this work are my allies. It's only with your help that we are going to make this a reality soon. We need more people to be effective crusaders, to be going out persuading the world that this needs to be done and it needs to be done urgently. I believe that Russia can be the world leader in actually delivering this technology if you try, because you already understand why it matters. So, hello, is this, there we go. So these are the kinds of concerns that I spend my life trying to allay when I speak to the media or to the general public or even to other scientists in most countries. They say, oh dear, if we didn't have aging, where would we put all the people? They'll say, oh dear, if we develop this technology, there will be even greater inequality in the world because only the rich will be able to afford them. They say things like, oh dear, dictators will live forever and won't it be boring living so long? I don't think I need to explain to you people why these objections are silly. But they are silly, and you need to be able to explain to other people really well why they're silly. The first step is, don't use the word immortality. You have probably noticed that the word immortality is even in the title of the talk that uh, is on the program. And it appears in the title of most of the newspaper articles that are written about this kind of work. But it's actually a bad word to use for this because it makes people think that this is science fiction and not real science. One needs to make sure that people understand that this is just medical research, same as any other medical research. You need to demystify it. In order to stop people thinking this way and start, people to think, start getting people to think this way, about a post-aging world, you need to use the right language. You need to be positive. You need to tell people, no, you should not be worried about there being too many people because other technologies are going to mean it's okay to have a lot of people. If we have more renewable energy, if we have better agriculture, then we can have more people with less environmental impact. So it's a, it's a it's an inappropriate concern. What we should be thinking about is the suffering that exists today when we don't have the cure for these diseases and disabilities. When we can bring those things under medical control, we won't have any Alzheimer's disease. We won't have any cancers of old age. We won't have atherosclerosis and heart attacks and strokes. That's the way that we need people to be thinking. And, of course, it's not just the diseases. It's the vitality that comes with being youthful, being physically and mentally just like a young adult. 
people like that will not be bored. They will be contributing wealth to society still. So everyone will be more prosperous. And that's why everybody will have access to these therapies, even if they cannot pay for them themselves. This is the problem that people have. It's a psychological problem. They think that aging is immutable, that nothing will ever be able to be done about it. Medicine cannot attack it. And because they think that, they don't really care whether aging is a good thing or a bad thing. But at the same time, they have the opposite problem. They think that aging is a good thing. They have convinced themselves that all of these supposed problems that would be created in a post-aging world mean that we should leave it alone. And therefore, they don't really care whether it can be fixed. So this kind of catch-22 that exists, this kind of circular logic is what holds people back. It's important to convince people to address these two questions separately to look closely at whether aging really is immutable, independently of the question of whether it's a good or a bad thing. This clicker is not what, there we go. We must also remember that even if we are pessimistic, even if there is a possibility that problems would be created as a side effect of solving the problem we have today, those problems simply would not be so large as the problem we have today. Today, 100,000 people die every day worldwide from aging. That's two-thirds of all deaths. In the industrialized world, it's something like 90% of all deaths. And of course, most of those people die after a long period of decline and disease and decrepitude and dependence and general misery. That's not good. It's a really big problem. And even if we ended up having to have fewer kids than we would like in order to ensure that there was enough space for everybody, is that really a worse problem than the problem we have today? No, it isn't. Finally, it's important to understand that we do not have the right to make a decision about the lives of people in the future. We just don't. Maybe there will be new technologies that will alleviate some of these problems. Maybe there won't. We cannot know, and therefore, we need to give humanity of the future the option, the choice whether to use these technologies or not. If we don't develop these technologies, these medicines, then they will not have that option. And we will be condemning them to an unnecessarily painful and unnecessarily early death. We have no right to do that. That moral argument is the strongest argument there is that says that we have a duty to be making this research happen as quickly as possible. As I was saying earlier, this is not about immortality. It's not even about longevity. Longevity is a side effect. This is all about health. This is all about the ultimate medicine that can keep people looking and feeling and functioning just like young adults, however long ago they were born, however old they are. If we can do that, then yes, there will be a longevity side effect. It'll be a big side effect. Most people will live far longer than anyone lives today. But it's still a side effect. It's a, good, it's a great side effect but it's still a side effect. And once you get that through to people, it becomes much easier to get them to see the positives about this dramatic change that is going to happen in, to humanity. This clicker really, there we go. I'm going to talk a little bit about the science as well, because one thing that it is vital to get through to people is that there might just be a new idea here. When someone comes up with a radical new suggestion, a new concept, the immediate reaction that most people have is either the concept is simply incorrect and the proposal is in fact impossible, it's science fiction, or it's obvious and it's already being done so it can be ignored. You have to avoid those two extremes. 
you have to get people to understand that humanity has been making a mistake, making an oversight. They have had a misunderstanding, a misconception, and that you are correcting that misconception so as to make the idea plausible. And this here is the misconception. When you ask people in what way someone, someone can be sick, they will normally say, well, there are these four types of sickness. There are infections, that's the first column. There are genetic diseases that we occasionally inherit from our parents, that's the second column. Then there are the chronic progressive diseases of old age, that's the third column. And then there is this completely separate thing called aging, which isn't a disease at all. That's what most people think. And it's a massive problem because it makes people think of the things in column three as if they are like the things in column one, as if they are like infections that can be cured. And the things in column four are not really diseases at all, and they maybe are not even in principle amenable to medical intervention. The only mistake here is where the black line is. This is the way that one ought to be thinking about disease. The things in column three are actually pretty much the same as the things in column four. Column three and column four are both side effects of being alive in the first place. So you need a different approach that is not like vaccination or antibiotics the way you might treat column one. Once you get that through to people, once you get them to understand that the diseases of old age are not like infections and they are like aging, they are part of aging, then people start to listen a lot more to the new ideas of how to do something about aging. This clicker is really not working well. There we go. This is the problem that people have at the moment. They attack the pathologies of old age directly, and it doesn't work. Geriatric medicine is a failure, and it's a failure for this obvious reason. If we accept that aging is a side effect of having been alive a long time, that means it's a side effect of the accumulation of damage that the body does to itself during life, throughout life, as a side effect of its normal operation. And of course that damage continues to accumulate and therefore any geriatric medicine is going to become less effective as the patient gets older. Some people have been thinking for maybe even a hundred years, including very early pioneers in Russia, that maybe we could slow down the rate of creation of damage. We could clean up the way the body works. But that hasn't worked either, basically because metabolism, the way the body works, is too complicated. It's far too complicated and we have not been able to change it so that it does not create damage unless we stop it from doing things we need it to do. But if we think about how we maintain simple machines like cars so that they last much longer than they were designed to last, like this car which is a hundred years old and it was only designed to last ten years, then we can see we could use the same concepts to treat the human body. We could do maintenance. Simply go in and periodically repair some of the damage that the body has created as a side effect of metabolism and thereby even though the damage is still being created we would stop it from accumulating to the level that causes sickness. This is how we do this. The specific approaches that Sense Research Foundation is pursuing there are only seven major types of damage that we need to address. And of course, if you want to know all about this, you should go to our website or you should read my book and so on because there's a huge amount of detail that needs to be looked at in order to understand why this is feasible. But the point is, it's a plan. It's a real, concrete, down-to-earth engineering design for how to bring the whole of aging, that means column three and column four from the previous table, under control. These approaches will eventually work. People know it. Uh, the Scientific Advisory Board of the Foundation consists of world-leading luminaries from all of these fields who are publicly endorsing this. Even the um, 
scientific literature has all of this now. These are some publications for, that we have uh, supported over the past several years. The, the, the one at the top was published just last week. That's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. DeGray. I have a short question to you, and that's less about the medicine, but more about social one. As you know, as everyone knows, uh, the good medicine cannot be cheap. So all the new technologies, they are extremely expensive. And the question is, in the most of the country, the society covers this cost in certain ways, in this and that way. And the question is, if we are talking about possibility to make life longer, who are the winners? Who would be those patients who are able to, to get this uh, longevity? Yeah. It's a very important question. And you may have noticed that one of the concerns that I put up on my slide was people will say, oh, maybe only the wealthy people will get yep. this. Not true. And the reason it's not true is very simple. It's because these medicines will pay for themselves economically. Mm -hmm. When someone is sick, they are not economically useful. They are consuming r money. They are consuming wealth. When someone is healthy, they are contributing wealth to society. So even if it will take a lot of advance investment by governments around the world to ensure that everybody who is old enough to need them will have these medicines, nevertheless, it will be money that will, be, will come back to the country very quickly. And okay. therefore, I'm quite sure everybody who is old enough to need them will have these medicines, whether or not they can pay for them. Okay, I got the answer. I would love to live in the world where is all the healthy people are economically effectively, mm -hmm. which is not the truth. But at the end of the day, that's the answer. Thank you very much. And we have only time for only one question from, from the hall. I've got it. for your great presentation. I'm very happy to greet you here from Russian branch of the International Longevity Alliance, the organization which is supporting the biomedical research to address the aging-related health damage. And uh, my question is about self-testing. Uh, right now, there is an ongoing experiment of Liz Parrish, who is testing the gene therapy uh, to address aging on herself. I would like to know what do you think of such self-experimentations and what its uh, role in the whole process of the scientific development. Thank you. Self-experimentation is a tradition that has existed for many, many years in science and medicine. Even a hundred years ago or more, there were very distinguished scientists who would do this. These days, it is considered less popular, less of a good idea, but I do not think we should, be, we should have a moral stance about this. I think if people want to do this, they should be allowed to. Furthermore, it is a way to actually find things out. Maybe this particular case is premature, maybe not. It is certainly well informed. Liz Parrish, whom I know well, she has good information leading to the decision she has made to be, as she calls herself, patient zero for these gene therapies. But we will see. I certainly don't think we should condemn it. Okay. Thank you very much. Спасибо большое. У нас на сцене был вечно молодой Орбит Грей.